And we will be starting by a talk from uh, Josh Long about cloud native Java. Josh? Well, thank you very much. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Salud to the world. Hi. Thanks, for thanks, everybody, for coming. I know you have a lot of great choices. We have one really great choice. That's uh, Dr. Heinz Kaboot, and you chose the lesser of the two. So thank you very much for, uh, for coming. Um, we're going to go through a lot of stuff today. We have very little time, just 50 minutes. So I really want you to uh, not worry. We're going to have the code that's available for you here online. If you want to follow later on, please note the code. Um, I'm also happy to answer questions and so on. Uh, I'm online. I'm, you know, I'm on the internet. So uh, how many of you have Twitter? Twitter, 2016, Twitter. 2017, ah, oh, see? This is why I can't work here. I'm not that smart. Uh, what about, what about email? How many of you have email? E-mail. Anybody? Email. All right. Huh? Huh? No? Okay. So, ah. so anyway, so anyway, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm available to answer questions. Uh, if you have them, you know, I'm, I'm here for you. Um, also, we have to take care of something very important and near and dear to my heart. Yesterday, I got to take a selfie with... The, uh, the, the, yeah, exactly, the CMS, which is not the garbage collector, here at CERN, and it makes me, it gives me goosebumps just to think about it. That's super cool. So I want to take a, a, a selfie with all of you, uh, and so what I, when, when I say fromage, <laughs> I, I want you all to say fromage with me, and it'll be awesome. Ready? One, or un, deux, trois, fromage. <laughs> Ah, parfait, merci. Okay, good stuff. So we have a lot to go through. Uh, a little bit about me. My name is Josh Long. How many of you have had the, uh, un the displeasure of seeing my talks before? Anybody? Okay, so the rest of you, my name is Josh. I work on the Spring team. I'm the Spring Devel Developer Advocate. I'm an open source engineer and contributor. I am the number one, top ranked for seven years, seven years now, more bugs. I've created more bugs in the code than any of the other engineers in the Spring Projects. This, the number one. Yeah. Number one. You're welcome. Exactly. So there's that. Uh, I work on a lot of different projects like Spring Boot and Spring Cloud, Spring Integration, Spring Batch, uh, Batch, Vaadin, Timeleaf Activity, etc. More bugs than any other engineer on those projects. I'm a, a Java champion, and, you know, and I've also done um, uh, training videos and books. The latest and greatest book, of course, is Cloud Native Java, the the book which I'm still working on, which I've been working on forever. It's an O'Reilly book. And uh, for those of you who are wondering about that bird, many people ask me about that bird. They don't, they don't know. I know that you're all scientists, and so you, you wonder about these things. That's a blue-eared kingfisher. It's a bird from the Indonesian Java Islands. It's a bird from the islands of Java. <laughs> now, 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 birds, birds fly. They fly in the clouds. <laughs> it's, a, it's a bird that is native to Java. It's a, it's a cloud native Java bird. It's a, it's a, never mind, never mind. It, it, it'll come, it'll come. There, there we go, it's fine. Don't worry about it. It's, gonna ha it's fine, don't worry about it. Uh, so, and I work at Pivotal, and at Pivotal we have a lot of great open source stuff. How many of you recognize some of these technologies? How many of you recognize, recognize them? What about Apache Tomcat? Tomcat. Okay, good stuff. Hot sauce. Very good. Uh, what about Spring? Spring. Right on. Good stuff. So, a lot of stuff there. A lot of open source bits. We also have a platform called Cloud Foundry. Cloud Foundry is an open source platform. It's optimized for managing and delivering applications to production. That's what we care about at Pivotal. And we have seen at Pivotal that a lot of different organizations are struggling with this. They want to go faster. They want to be able to deliver business value, or in this case, actual value, scientific value, uh, to the production, uh, you know, stage. I imagine in your case, the rush to go to production uh, is a little more explosive if it's incorrect, right? So maybe it's not the same thing as uh, a lot of other businesses, a lot of in other enterprises, but still, going faster and getting results faster uh, increases our ability to, to see results and to, to do more experiments, right? Very fundamental to the scientific uh, process. So 
We see a lot of organizations trying to go faster, but they struggle. They, they don't know how to take their large, existing, monolithic applications, applications that were written in a time before, and they don't know how to take them and turn them into smaller pieces, smaller batches of work. We can, we can take some good advice. Dr. Eric Evans, he talks about uh, a bounded context in his book, Domain Driven Design. A bounded context is a part of the domain model that you can work with by itself. It's internally consistent. So you don't need to talk to other things to be able to understand what that uh, entity, what that domain means in a bounded context. If you can identify bounded contexts, then you can use those as the basis for your services. Right? A bounded context is a natural place to divide your large applications into smaller pieces. The benefit of this is that you can now focus small groups of people on that single service, on, that, on those different services. They don't have to, uh, all, you, know, you don't have to get the whole organization involved in working on the code base. You can divide the code base into smaller pieces. This allows organizations to go faster. Now work in the organization can go from product management to user experiences to developers to testers to administrators and then off into production. What I'm describing here, of course, is a microservice. Microservices give you the ability to optimize your organization and optimize for human potential. So it's a good idea for a lot of organizations because it allows them to go faster, to deliver work into production faster without having to spend so much time waiting for everybody to test and everybody to stabilize and everybody to contribute and so on, their code. Microservices have a lot of benefits, but they also invite pain. They invite complexity. And that complexity can be uh, daunting. It can be very difficult for people to work with if you're not prepared. There are two big problems that people face when they go to this architecture. First of all, how quickly can I build a service that is worthy of production? That has load balancing and security and you know, DNS and uh, heartbeat detection and it's observable and monitorable. How quickly can I handle all of these things? in my application. These are things that I have to handle, but they are not why I'm here, right? I solve them because I want, to, I, I want my application to be in production, not because that's what I care about when I try to solve this problem. Very few people start businesses and they say, I'm gonna solve SSL, right? That's not why most of us are here. We're trying to solve actual problems. So that's the first thing. The first thing is how quickly can I do that? The second thing is, once I've done this, I have now a lot of different services I have a lot of different services in production and they're separated by network partitions. They're distributed. This creates complexity that is very hard to manage. And if there's anything, indeed even one thing that we can all agree on, I'm sure it's this. Building distributed systems is hard. And so we need to be prepared to address that complexity. So for the first thing, for that first aspect, for that first concern, we can use something like Spring Boot for building software that's easily, uh, e you know, easy and, and quick to write. And then we can use things like Cloud Foundry to deploy and manage the applications. That's a, uh, you know, common enough approach. But for, that, for the second concern, we need to handle the concerns related to distribution. And for this, we have Spring Cloud. And that's what we're going to look at here today. So how many of you have uh, heard of or worked with or know about Spring Boot? How many of you have heard about it? Okay. Okay. So... Spring Boot is basically Spring with less configuration, right? It's a nice, consistent way to write um, applications without worrying too much. Now, we're going to build a simple application today, and I don't want to spend too much time on the domain model. I don't want to spend too much time dealing with... Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very good. I don't want to spend too much time focusing on the domain model. So we're going to build a very simple service. Uh, okay, I'm going to call this the reservation service. And I'm going to build the service here at start.spring.io. <laughs> this is my second favorite place on the internet. My first favorite place is production. I love production. You should love production. Production is the happiest place on earth. It's better than Disneyland. <laughs> bring your kids, bring your family. It's the nicest place. But if you haven't gone to production, then you can begin your journey here at Start. That spring that I owe. <laughs> if your children cannot sleep, start. Point. Spring. Point. Io. 
if you suffer from indigestion after a long night of PHP and start that spring that I owe. And if you need inspiration in the early morning before your cup of tea or coffee, start that spring that I owe. So we're going to build a simple service. I'm going to call this the reservation service. I'm going to use a lot of different technologies here. I'm going to, I'm going to use H2. H2 is an in-memory, embedded SQL database. It's in-memory, and it's going to lose all of its state after every single restart, right? I'm not going to persist the data, so it's going to always lose its data. Very similar to MongoDB. It just loses the data all the time <laughs> for, no, for no reason at all. Just, just no reason. No reason at all, right? So... There we go. I'm going to use JPA, the Java Persistence API, because I make poor life decisions. So, JPA. Oh, 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 yeah. Yeah. It's true, though. So, config client. I'm going to use config client for centralized configuration. I'll use Eureka for service registration and discovery. I'll use Zipkin for distributed tracing. I'll use RabbitMQ for stream processing. I'll use uh, REST repository support. And I think maybe that's enough. No, maybe actuator as well. There we go. So, naturally, I could... I could switch to the full version. I could switch to the full version and I get more checkboxes, more things that I could add to my application. But for now, I'm very happy to leave the choices as they are. I've got enough. Now, we have a few drop-downs up here, my friends. Drop-downs that people look at and they get very confused. Uh, for the choice of language, of course, you can choose any language on the JVM that supports annotations and objects. That's fine. Right? Uh, Java, Groovy, Kotlin, Scala, Ceylon, they're all great choices, right? You can uh, see that we have two more drop downs here, however. And these are what I, what I like to call non choices. They're not actually choices. They're choices that you could make, but that you should not. They're choices in the same way that running naked in traffic is a choice. <laughs> you, you could, but, 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 but don't. <laughs> don't. So, for example, what version of the JVM would you like to use? 1.9 is almost here, and both of these are end of life. To continue using either one of these is insane and irresponsible. So we'll leave it as is. And then here we have the choice of packaging, and people get confused about this. They don't know when and where to choose which. So I'll do my best to explain. If, by some crazy accident of physics some freak accident of physics, you find yourself stuck in the distant, distant past as though you have time traveled, then use dot war. <laughs> but if you're here in 2017, then use dot jar. This is a big part of my overarching guiding personal philosophy of make jar, not war. And again, you have choices, you have options, you should do what works for you. So I'm going to go ahead and hit generate. And we're going to open up our application and I'm going to build a very simple service. I don't want to spend too much time on the service. What I want to do is I want to build an application so that we have something with which we can work. All right? Oh, how many of you are using IntelliJ? Just curious. Good stuff. Hot sauce. Well done. What, what about NetBeans? NetBeans is awesome. How many of you are using NetBeans? Right on. Good stuff as well. What about Eclipse, which is also awesome? Right on as well. All good choices. What about Emacs? Are you here? Are you here? There's that one guy. Every single talk I do, it's the same human being. Every. He's not here? You kept him at the door? <laughs> he's very, very fast. He, he comes to my talks and I say, are you here, sir? He raises his hand and then he leaves. <laughs> Just so he can be at the next place to raise his hand. So what we're going to do is we're going to build a simple application. It's a, a, a simple application to manage entities of type reservation, right? I'm going to say at entity, right? JPA here. Uh, and uh, I'll give it a primary key like this and I'll say... Uh, at ID, at generated value. So all I'm doing is I'm creating an auto-incrementing surrogate ID, a primary key here, right? Uh, and then I'm going to give it a single field, reservation name, right? This is the name of the reservation for a restaurant or a hotel or whatever. I don't care. It's a very simple domain, right? Now, this is the essence 
of what I want to express. But this is Java, of course, so I need a constructor. I need some, uh, I need some getters, right? There's that. I need a two-string method. There's this. I need, uh, what else do I need? I need another no-argument constructor. This is for JPA, right? Right here. Okay. <laughs> and uh, there we go. So there we go. There's my simple JPA entity, and I want to save data into the database, so I'm going to create a spring data repository. I'll say reservation repository extends JPA repository of type reservation whose primary key is of type long. And what I want to do is I want to save data in the database. This repository will automatically be implemented for me. I don't have to implement that class, that interface. Spring data will do that for me. And there's other modules for MongoDB or Cassandra or Neo4j or RabbitMQ, not Rabbit, Redis or, uh, you know, all these different things, Couchbase. So use whatever you want. But I'm going to insert some data into the database here so we have some sample data. Uh, let's see here. So this is a callback component. This class implements the command line runner. And when Spring Boot starts up, it's going to call this uh, void run method on the application startup. So let's see. Who's here today? My name is Josh. I'm here. Uh, let's see. Stefan, of course, the one and only. Uh, Mr. Hazel. There we go. Um, who else? Antonio Monami. Okay. Who else? What about you, my friend? What's your name? My name is Como ça? Okay, very good. Uh, what about you, buddy? What's your name? Mate. How do you spell it? Mate. Uh, M A E J. M A E J. D E J. Like so? <laughs> Wh which one is it? <laughs> this one. Okay. It's okay? Okay, very good. Uh, miss, what's your name? How do you spell it? TJ, very good, thank you. Uh, and what about you, Miss? What's your name? How do you spell it? K A T E. Very good. Nice to meet you all. So thanks for coming. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to visit every single record that we have there and save it to the database. Then I'm going to get every single record that comes out of the database and just confirm it's working. Now, what I want to do is also stand up a REST API, right? This is a service, so I need a REST API. I'm going to use Spring Data REST, right? I've got Spring Boot Starter Data REST, okay? Whoops. I'm going to go back to Spring Boot 1.4 so I don't get snapshots and waste our time here today, okay? So Spring Boot Starter Data REST, I'm going to add that just in case, and that will allow me to make this repository into a REST API. I'll just say repository REST resource. Uh, and then that, I think, should be it. Let's go ahead and comment out some of the stuff we don't need right now. So we don't need this right now. We don't need RabbitMQ right now. We don't need these things right now. Okay, so that'll be enough, I think, to go. Let's run it. Let's see what we get. Now, I've got an application. If you know much, if you know much about Spring Boot, then you know that it's easy to configure such an application. I can open up the property file, application.properties, and I can say server.port equals 8080 or... 8010, for example. This is the default place where uh, Spring Boot looks for properties, right? I can change the default behavior. Another alternative is to go to the actual jar itself, right? I can say CD uh, reservation service maven minus D skip test because YOLO, right? <laughs> Clean install. And I can go to the target directory and I can say Java minus D server dot port equals AD ten minus jar reservation service dot jar and that'll spin up the application this time overriding the default port. I used a dash D argument. So I'm using configuration just like here, right? Server dot port, but I used it in the command line. This is called twelve factor style configuration. That's very useful, right? I can see that that worked. If I go to localhost AD ten forward slash uh, reservations there's our API, there's some hypermedia data, uh, we've got the deep linking records, right? I'm using my REST API and I'm using it on port 8010. Now this REST API has links. This is hypermedia. This is an implementation of a design pattern called HADOS, or hypermedia as the engine of application state. It's the idea that every REST API should have enough information for the client to uh, work with the API without any a priori knowledge, right? without any upfront knowledge. Uh, it's very important when you move to distributed systems because very few developers write documentation and zero developers read it. None. Zero. <laughs> so 
you need to make it as humane as possible, as, as friendly as possible to work with that API. What we have here is a self-describing service. These links tell me my menu of choices, my options, right? Now, I have this application. Uh, this configuration style that I just showed you is a good start, but it's not great. It has several limitations. First of all, oh yeah, no? Okay. It has several limitations. First of all, what if I have more than one application? Do I have to copy and paste those configuration properties uh, from one shell script to another? That's not very good. Uh, what about secure information, passwords, locators, things like that? I don't want that laying around on the file system unencrypted, right? That's, that's a big deal, right? Especially in light of the, the Cloudflare thing, right? We've got to make sure that our passwords to anything interesting are encrypted. What about auditing and journaling? I want to see who changed the configuration and when. I want to see what happened, and if I need to, I want to roll it back, right? I need to be able to have that facility. Uh, and then finally, I want to be able to change the configuration while the service is running. So while this is a start, it's not really good enough, is it? What I want to do is I want to have a single directory with my configuration in it, that would solve the uh, centrality issue, right? Now, all of my services could talk to the directory full of configuration files. That's a start. Another option might be to version control that directory. That would also give me the auditing and journaling. But what about the, the security? What about the encryption? And then what about also the, uh, the live reloading? For this, I need something more. So what we're going to do is we're going to build a, a REST API to manage our configuration, right? Our configuration will be based on Git. But it'll be, an, it'll be behind this REST API. So I'm going to create something called the config server. And I'll generate that. And the config server will babysit. It'll sit in front and mediate access to a directory full of configuration. So I need to create that directory. Right? I need to clone that directory. I happen to have a directory based on, Git, on GitHub. I'm going to clone this here. And I'll clone that to my desktop config directory here. Okay. And then meanwhile, this is downloading the world config service, at enable config server, and I keep forgetting to put it back to 4.4. They released a new version, and I haven't updated. So there's that. Um, now, my, con my application, before it can do its work, it needs to be po told to run on port uh, 8888, right? And uh, I need to tell it where to find the configuration. I'll say spring cloud ser config server dot git dot uri equals, and I'm going to point it to the directory where I installed the configuration on my desktop in the config directory, right? So home, desktop, config. Very good. So let's go ahead and start this up. Now, this is going to be a REST API that my other microservices can talk to to get their configuration. Now, the configuration isn't baked into the jar. It's not compiled in the jar. I can override it and so on. So all I need to do to use that configuration is to use the configuration client, right? So here I'm going to use the configuration, the Spring Cloud Starter config property, or library rather. And then I need to tell Spring Cloud the name of my application. I'm going to name it reservation-service. I also need to tell it where to find the config server, right? Uh, I can use this property to change the default value, but by default it's going to look at localhost 8888 anyway. So, you know, I can leave it as is. I'm just very lazy and I'd prefer not to do this, right? So localhost 8888. That's fine, but it's <coughs> redundant in this case, okay? Now, if I, if I successfully start the application up, if I go to 8888 reservation service default, I can see that this is the configuration for the microservice called reservation hyphen service. And I can see that there are several different reservation uh, or other property sources, one for reservation service dot properties and another one for application dot properties. All the microservices will get their configuration from application.properties and then for the property from the property file specific to that service. So reservation service will identify and connect with this property file. It'll start on port 8000 and it'll have access to this message, hello world, right? So let's see that work. Let's create an endpoint here. We'll say at rest controller class uh, message rest controller, okay? And I'm going to create a value, private string value. And I'm going to create a constructor. And in the constructor, I'm going to tell Spring, please inject that message from the config server there. And uh, I'm going to expose that configuration here as an endpoint. Right Now, I can imagine wanting to change this value later on. It's good, but it's not great, is it? So I want to make this bean refresh scoped. 
Okay, that means that I can recreate the bean live while the service is running. I don't have to restart the service each time just to see the new configuration. So let's see it work. Well, first of all, are we on the right port? Move out of the way, IntelliJ. We're on port 8000, so I think we're in a good place. Let's see, localhost 8000 forward slash reservations. There we go, there's that. Now here's the message endpoint. That's good, but it's not great, right? We need to do better. So let's go to the desktop config directory here, open up this property file, and I'll say, uh, bonjour, CERN, extra K. There we go. And if I look at the uh, property file, reservation service properties, it says that message, I'm gonna do a git commit, minus A minus O YOLO, okay? Git status, it's committed, right? There's the, uh, pro that's the, the poop from my little editor. Okay, goodbye to that. Now, my, my microservice, my config service, sees the new value. But my microservice does not. It does not know what happened. I have to tell it to refresh its configuration. I can do this a few ways. The easiest is to trigger what's called an actuator endpoint. Spring Boot has this idea of actuators. Actuators are management endpoints for things like uh, environment variables and uh, for health checks and for all these things that are contributed to the application. So, for example, health, right? This tells me the health of the application and so on, you know? But uh, there's another actuator endpoint called refresh, like that. And all I have to do is I have to send a, um, a uh, empty HTTP post. So curl minus D HTTP localhost 80, oh sorry, 8000 forward slash refresh. Now I'm not gonna hit go yet, okay? We'll wait for this to line up. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit, as soon as I hit go, I'm gonna hit enter then I'm going to hit Command Tab, and then Command R as fast as my aching fingers will let me, <laughs> as fast as I can. Whew. Okay, one, oh. two, three, go. <laughs> ah. No, Whoop. there we go. Up, oh. come on, son of a gun. Eh, eh, I eh. That was very unsatisfying. Usually it's very fast, but anyway. So I've refreshed the configuration. I didn't have to restart the service, you know? This gives me the ability to do things like feature flags. I can decouple the deployment of software from the release of software. Another pattern that becomes very useful in a distributed system is making it easy for one system to find another, right? So I want to be able to support e service registration and discovery. This is very important in a distributed system because you cannot have your clients coupled to other systems' IPs. So I'm going to use the service registries. Spring Cloud makes it easy to, to work with different service registries thanks to the discovery client abstraction, right? Uh, I happen to be a big fan of one particular service registry called Eureka, right? There are different service registries out there uh, that Spring Cloud supports, Apache Zookeeper, ha HashiCorp Console, Eureka, um, you know, uh, etc. But I like Eureka the most for two reasons. First of all, it has been used by Netflix uh, for a very long time at very large scales. Not as, uh, not as crazy a scale as the data coming off of your CERN devices here, but still pretty crazy, right? So that's part one. The other, the other thing is that it's super simple to set up. And I'm a big fan, and I'm also very lazy, so that helps a lot. So Eureka hyphen service, Eureka service application, at enable Eureka server, and go, okay? So it'll come up on 8761. Come on, there we go. So this is, the ser this is the service registry. This is my Eureka registry. There's a few things to notice. First of all, very well done, mouse over. <laughs> very well done. We have people for that. That took a year. <laughs> anyway, the other thing is that we don't have any applications here yet, right? There's no registration. So we need to teach our reservation service to say, hello, I'm here if you need me, you know? So we have to go back to our build and bring in Spring Cloud Starter Eureka. Here we go, okay? That's the discovery client abstraction implementation for Eureka. And then we just go up here and we say, at enable discovery client. Very good. So enable discovery client. Uh, and then that's on the class path and we just restart. Okay, I'll drink some water. 
Now, once that's up, we want to build a client to talk to it. We need to talk to that service through the registry instead of using IP addresses or DNS. DNS is an okay choice in a, cert, in a, in a distributed system, but it has limitations. Mostly that clients uh, cache, they cache the results of the DNS load balancer. So you end up defeating the load balancer, right? You want to be able to hold, control the load balancing decision on the client. Another problem with DNS is that it requires separate infrastructure that other teams typically manage. So as we move to a microservices architecture, we want to be able to control both how things get routed in the system, which is something you do on the client, and we want to be able to control the evolution of our service. If we change the, the DNS entry for a service and that breaks another part of the team, another team in the or organization, then we have to go slower in order to be able to make sure that that doesn't happen, right? So let's see. We're going to build a client. We're going to use the REST repository support. We'll use Actuator. We're going to use the RabbitMQ stream processing support. Zipkin for distributed tracing. Hystrix a circuit breaker. Fane for simplified REST clients. Um, config client. Eureka support. Actuator support. We've already got that, right? Uh, and anything else? Anything else? Did we? Am I missing something obvious? Anything at all? Web support, maybe? Sorry? Thank you. Yes. Oh, son of a gun. Merci. That's so good. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and start this up. I think this will be enough for now. Who knows? We don't know what time we have. So um, here we go. Reservation, we have to give our, our service a name. So we'll say spring application name equals reservation hyphen client. And then we go to our code and we participate in service registration and discovery. Now, what I want to do is I want to build a application that can talk to my uh, original service. The service is the reservation service. This is not just a client for the sake of building a client, though. I'm building a special kind of client called an edge service. Edge services are the first door into your system, the first port of call, if you will, for requests coming from the outside world, from your iPhones, from your Playstations, from your Rokus, from your Large Hedron Super Colliders, from your, you know, Xboxes, whatever it is, all these things have IP addresses, right? And so they have different security requirements, different pro protocols and payloads and so on. The edge service is where you handle those kinds of requirements. You adapt outside requests. Think about like Netflix. Netflix has all these different types of devices. Some have limitations in the browser URL parameters that they can accept. Some have different protocols, some different security restrictions. So instead of changing every microservice, they just change the edge service. They'll have an iPhone edge service or a large Hedron Super Collider edge service or a, you know Android edge service or something like that or a Windows phone for that one guy, right? Uh, so we need to be able to adapt here. One thing I would love to do is to just talk to my, my downstream service, right, to proxy the data. And for this, we can use Zool. Now, Zool is a micro-proxy. Now, it's a micro-proxy from a company called Netflix. How many of you have uh, heard of Zool? How many of you know Zool? Zool is the monster from the Ghostbusters movie. Anybody remember that? He's the, he's the gatekeeper into the underworld, à l'enfer right? The gatekeeper to the demon world. He's the gateway. He's the edge serv... No? Okay. It's fine. It's fine. Anyway, what I want to do is I want to be able to talk to that service. So there's a lot of different ways to, to talk to that service. I'm going to just use a microproxy. Microproxies are very convenient. Let me uh, get rid of this here. There we go. So I can, the f easiest way is just to say at enable zoo proxy and hit restart. Now, the microproxy is going to talk to the registry. It's going to get all the service IDs in the registry, all the routes that are available in the registry, like this one, reservation service. It's on this URL here. It's on this service ID in this port. It's going to programmatically talk to that, and it's going to set up routes for me that I can use. So reservation hyphen service forward slash reservation. So this is the edge service. Here is the actual service on port 8000. Actual edge. Actual edge. <coughs> Actual? Edge. Actual edge. Actual. Nope. Actual. Edge. Actual edge. Actual. Edge. Actual edge. Amazing. So, a couple things you may be wondering. First of all, how is this edge service routing the request? It's got the ID in the URL. Of course, that's a clue. We have one instance, so yeah, of course, it's using that one instance. But what if we had 10, or 100, or 1,000, or even just two? <laughs> it has to choose. It has to say, I choose you like a Pokemon, 
and then route to that instance, right? It does this on the client using something called Netflix Ribbon. Netflix Ribbon is a client-side load balancer. It provides different strategies for load balancing. The default, of course, is round robin, but now you can do other kinds of load balancing strategies, like when you want to do a, a multi-data, multi-data center kind of load balancing, or if you want to do uh, rack-aware load balancing, or if you want to do data locality or data sharding, or if you want to do the, the kinds of load balancing that, that pins a request with an OAuth token to a particular node because that node is streaming a video or something, right? It's, it's stateful. You can do all these strategies in the client. That is a, that's already plugged in for you. That gets implemented for you automatically. You can override the load balancing strategy using Java code. You don't have to change the router or the load balancer, the F5, right? You don't have to file a request ticket for IT to update that, that particular uh, uh, route and do something that it can't do anyway, right? Uh, the other, ben- other thing you may be wondering is, what about the URLs? From the perspective of my iPhone client or my HTML5 browser, this URL looks like it was generated on this node, even though we know that it was generated on this node. The proxy sends a request to the original node with the URL, the origin URL. So it looks like it was generated there. So the client does not know. This is a good approach. I think the the micro proxy gives us a lot of benefits, but sometimes I want to have my own endpoints that have their own data. So I want to create an API adapter, right? So I want to say class reservation names or class reservation REST controller, right? A, a, A reservation API adapter REST controller, because I am nothing if not concise, right? So I will say at REST controller, and I'm going to create an endpoint that just returns the names, right? I'm not going to, I'm not going to return all of the data. I want to return a client-specific view of the data, right? I want to say string names, and I'm, I'm not going to return all of the hypermedia links. I'll just return the names Josh and Stefan and, and Mark and so on, all my, oh, sh- I'm so sorry. Oh, no. (laughs) It's not right. He wouldn't do that to me. He's so nice. Antonio. Okay, I'm sorry. (laughs) Crisis averted. Don't worry. Okay, so... um, I've got this, uh, this edge service. I want to get just the names, right? So I'm going to create an endpoint here. I could use the REST template. I could say to the REST template, let's make a call to that service. And the REST template would certainly work, but the REST template doesn't know about our load balancing. It doesn't know about ribbon, right? I could create a custom load, uh, REST template like so. I could say at load balance REST template and uh, return new REST template. And that would work as well, but I don't want to spend so much time writing low-level HTTP code. Instead, what I want to do is I want to write a... Uh, run a simple client. I don't want to spend all of my time writing HTTP code and messaging code for, for each other service that I want to talk to. Different organizations have different standards here. Some will say, oh, well, you know, you can build a Java client, but you, you have to make sure that the business logic lives in the service itself, not in the client. Others say, oh, well, you know, if you're going to build something, at least be automatable and repeatable. That way, there's no business logic, uh, but you can still provide the jar so that other people can use that client instead of making every other team write their own HTTP code and messaging code. So, Fain is a great project from Netflix. This is uh, here, Fain. Fain in English, it means to pretend, to act like or act as. So if you see an animal in the forest like this, right, it's pretending to be dead. It's not actually dead, don't worry. It's fine. It's just pretending because it wants you to leave it alone. It's feigning dead. Very similar to the way WebSphere feigns utility. It's not actually useful. It just, it just pretends to be dead, right? It's not, it's not there. So we're going to use feign to build a REST client. And it's not actually a REST client. It's just an interface. So we're going to say interface reservation reader. And we're going to return a collection of hypermedia resources whose payload is of type reservation. Now the question, of course, is where does that entity, the reservation, come from? I could copy the type from my implementation uh, and put it on the class path here, but that would couple my client to the implementation of the service. So in this case, I prefer to have a DTO, a separate type, right? Now in order for this to work, I need to say that it's a Fane client and it's going to load balance its requests to the reservation service. I'm also going to make this a uh, HTTP get call that calls the reservation's endpoint. So when somebody calls, when somebody injects this interface, a bean implementing this interface, they can 
call that method and it will call this service for them. So let's do this again. Private final reservation reader. And we need a constructor, naturally. Okay. And here, I'm going to say return reservation reader dot read. Now, what I want to do is I want to get the content, the collection of hypermedia resources, which has the links and the payload. I want to stream over it. I want to map from each reservation to a reservation name. And then I want to collect the records into a list of string. Like so. Easy, right? Sure. Oh, that's nice. I'm a big fan of Java 8. So this is going to work. This will do fine in the happy path. If I have one or many instances of the service, it will work. But what happens if I have zero instances? No instances? It's going to blow up, right? It'll give us big fat Java stack trace in my iPhone. It's not nice. It's no way to run a railroad. So we need to do better. We need to understand that in a high we need to understand that distributed systems will fail. That's a fact. It's not a matter of when, a matter of if, it's a matter of when, right? So we need to build a little bit of graceful degradation here. One way to do that is to use a circuit breaker, right? And there's uh, a great library also from Netflix called Hystrix. So I'm going to, I've got this on the class path, do I not? So Spring, Cloud, Starter, Hystrix. There we are, good. So Hystrix, oh, it's already on the class path. Never mind. Uh, Hystrix, I can enable this by saying at enable circuit breaker. There we go. And now, I can say hystrix command fallback method equals fallback, right? Fallback. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say if there's an exception that is thrown in this method, then just call this other method. High-performing websites do this kind of thing all the time. They'll, you might go to a search engine, a shopping website, and the search engine is down. And they'll say, oh, well, the search engine isn't working, but here are some machine-learned recommendations from across the web. It's, it's not exactly what you wanted, but it's better than getting the, uh, the equivalent of the middle finger you know, <laughs> on the web page, basically, right? So that's nice. We like, we like the graceful degradation. So let's see what happens. Localhost 99 reservation names. There's the names correctly spelled. <laughs> and uh, it, everything's fine because the service exists. Now let's go kill our poor service. <gasps> Au revoir. Okay. So now I make a call. Fail. Look at that. It gave me the empty array list. You see, if I make enough calls, it's slow. My goodness, so slow. But if I go, 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 go. There we go. See, now each time very fast, right? The circuit breaker is smart. It says, I have seen that there are too many exceptions and it moves the, tra the railroad tracks to the fallback. It gives the downstream service time to recover. We want to protect that downstream service. The last thing that we should do is to overwhelm it, to deluge it. We all know that if a website isn't working, you should refresh the browser a lot, right? <laughs> is that true? It's not true for distributed systems either. So this helps protect, protect against that. If you have a, a cloud computing technology like Cloud Foundry, Cloud Foundry will start it back up and make sure it's up and running, but you need to give it time to recover. Now, I've got an application, and this will eventually heal itself. The circuit breaker will be aware of the heartbeat from the Eureka registry. The registry will say, I have seen the service. It's here. It'll open the circuit again and let traffic flow through. What I want to do now is to talk about how we can observe the behavior of the system. It's a distributed system. Having something that is robust and resilient to failure is important for building a cloud-native system. It is e important to be able to evolve the system quickly. It's also important to be able to take advantage of distribution, to scale out. But the fourth most important characteristic of a distributed system is observability. I need to be able to monitor the system and understand what the system is doing by monitoring its output. The system is not supposed to be a black box. It's a bad idea if you have one node. But the, if you have just one instance and one node, a lot of things become much easier. If I have a no pointer in the monolithic application, where is the no pointer? Not everybody at once. Thank you. It's in the monolith. You don't have to spend a lot of time finding the bug because there's only one place it could be. There. But when you move to a distributed system, it's a train wreck, right? You've got a lot of places where you can have problems. So you need to have visibility. One way to get visibility is to monitor that circuit breaker, right? That circuit breaker uh, is a proxy for the other systems that I'm calling. I cannot change other people. I cannot fix their terrible, terrible, terrible life decisions. I can't make them use better technology to build more robust systems. Some things are going to be written in PHP. That's just a fact. I can't, I can't fix that. There's nothing I can do, right? But what I can do 
is make sure that my system is robust when their systems fail, right? I want to monitor their system's failure to protect my system. So the Hystrix dashboard gives us an ability to monitor our circuit breakers. If the circuit is open, then it's going to go to the fallback, and we can monitor that. So I'm going to say 1.44, thank you, Hystrix dashboard, Hystrix dashboard, config client, Eureka discovery, go. Okay, open this up. Oh my goodness, we're almost out of time. So we say, at enable, Hystrix dashboard, at enable discovery client, spring.application name equals Hystrix dashboard. Very good, okay? I'm going to start this up, and this will give us a way to monitor the state of that circuit breaker in the system. We can monitor many circuit breakers, but we've only got one right now. Now, the circuit breaker in the, in the code generates a server sent event heartbeat stream. It's on my edge service on port 9999histrix.stream. The stream is infinite. It goes on and on and on and on and on and on forever and ever <laughs> and ever. Like the skies <laughs> and the seas and the stars <laughs> and the bugs in your code just, just, just <laughs> infinite just forever and ever so whatever you do and I cannot, I cannot be more I cannot underscore this enough whatever you do whatever you do do not curl this endpoint <laughs> don't so what we're going to do is monitor that stream by going to the Hystrix dashboard here at 8010, pasting the URL into the dashboard uh, dialog there and hitting monitor. Now, I'm going to go to the ed edge service, make some requests. It's calling my reservation service, and I can see the moving average of traffic, 28, 35, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that gives me visibility into the state of that one circuit breaker. If I kill the reservation service, this will go to open, and I can see that. Now, this is one way to visualize the flow of data in a distributed system. The map in a distributed system is not the terrain. The, the actual experience of being in Geneva and being at CERN is not the same as looking at the Google map, isn't it? If I'm, in, if I'm in these places and I'm walking around, there's so much more to see than looking at the map. The same is true for your distributed system. The architecture diagram is not the distributed system. You must monitor the flow of data through the system itself in production. You cannot just approximate it. A good way to do that is to use distributed tracing. So there are a lot of different ways to do this, but it's, it's very painful if you have to do it yourself. What we want to do is to... Uh, oops... I've got a few dependencies in there. I went too fast. What we want to do is we want to be able to monitor the flow of data from one node to another. As one, as, one, as one message goes from one node to another, I want to be able to see that in one place, right? I could use logging and, and channel my output to Elasticsearch, but I would still have to do a lot of archaeology. I would have to look through my, uh, my magnifying glass to find things. So let's see. I forgot a few things here. Uh, Zipkin, Zipkin hyphen server. Okay. Close that. I need a Spring Cloud Starter Config. And I need Spring Cloud Starter Eureka. Eureka. Okay. Very good. Zipkin service. I'll say at enable Zipkin server, at enable discovery client, and I'll start this up. Now, what I'm building is my, I'm building a, I'm building a Zipkin tracing server. That way I can visualize uh, the flow of messages through the system. In order to make this work, I need to have the Spring Cloud Starter um, Zipkin client on the class path in my applications. That's all, right? So Spring Cloud Starter Zipkin. Okay. There we are. Is that it? Should be it. Yeah, there it is. Okay, so we refresh the reservation service. Now let's go to the reservation client here and we'll change it as well. Spring Cloud Starter Zipkin. <coughs> okay, and we'll restart this one as well. Whoops. Oh wait, <coughs> restarted too fast. Go, go, go. Okay. 
14. Okay, come on. Come on, computers. People are watching. Oh, that's the history dashboard because I killed the stream. Okay, so localhost 9411, right? That's where we, uh, did I forget to name it? Zipkin hyphen service application at properties. That name equals zipkin hyphen service, so I can talk to the config server. Restart again. Oh, I'm restarting all the things. So what, it's gonna do, what this is going to do is, as I make a request, I'm going to publish that request out of band to the Zipkin server, which is going to then monitor it and analyze it. That'll give me a chance to visualize it, visualize it in one place. What's important is that I don't want to visualize every single request in my system. I would overwhelm my monitoring tool. Zipkin was created by Twitter. Twitter uses it to monitor the flow of messages in their distributed systems. They don't monitor every single message. They monitor one out of every several million. They don't need to see more than that, right? So... Are we okay? Go, go. Hystrix dashboard, Zipkin service, good. And great ASCII artwork. Come on. I'm running way too many processes at this point. Okay, so you can see the clients are working. They want to talk to the Zipkin server. Okay. Looks legit. Let's do this. So localhost, 94.11. Okay. There we go. There's our Zipkin server. Right now it doesn't see any traffic, so we need to go to our endpoint here, localhost, reservation names. Oh, I restarted the uh, edge service. I've started the actual reservation service separately, right? So there's this. It'll re-register in a second. Okay. Oh, no. Th this is running. That's fine. And the client is... Oh, it's still starting up. Registry, localhost... T4761. There we go. Things should be happy. This is Antonio's fault. <laughs> uh, let's see. The client needs to just go faster. There's a 30 second heartbeat, and I don't have time to wait for that 30 seconds, so we're going to go restart it quickly. Oh, don't ever. Do the restart at the right at the beginning of the at the end of the talk. I'm sorry about that, folks. So okay, come on, computer, faster. The reservation client is now participating. You can see that it's going to participate because there's this yellow output here. As it spins up, come on. Oh my goodness. Too many things running. Okay. Well, I broke something. Oh, well, if I go to... Oh, there we go. Is that working? There we go. So as I make a request, finally, on the client... There we go. If I make these requests on the client... I can go to the Zipkin server. It says that there's a client and a service. Click on one of those. I can hit Find Trace, and it shows me the waterfall graph of the requests that have flown through the system. If I click on this, it shows me that I have uh, one request that took a total of 2.49 milliseconds, whatever. Uh, I click on the node. I can see that the message entered here and exited there. Here's the specifics about the request itself. I can see the relative timings for the request as well. So I can see where it went, when it left, where it arrived. I can see any context information about the request in the service. All right, so with that awkward bit of uh, digression aside, we've looked today at how to build a system that is easy to evolve very quickly with Spring Boot. We've looked at how to build a system that uh, benefits from uh, dynamic external configuration and 12-factor style configuration. We looked at service registration and discovery with the Spring Cloud abstraction for discovery client and, and using Eureka in particular. We looked at circuit breakers with the Hystrix circuit breaker. We looked at uh, declarative REST clients using Fane. We looked at um, observability 
uh, with, uh, with the Zipkin uh, and uh, the Hystrix dashboard, what we didn't look at could fill the whole room. My goodness, we, we didn't look at how to do distributed contracts, right, between services to make sure that if I evolve my API, my clients don't break. That's called Spring Cloud Contract. We didn't look at messaging-based microservices using Spring Cloud Stream, for example, with Apache Kafka or RabbitMQ instead of using REST. Uh, we didn't look at using uh, st- uh, Dataflow and analytics with Spring Cloud Dataflow, which builds on top of Spring Cloud Stream. We didn't look at automating your build pipeline to get a continuous delivery pipeline on top of Jenkins or Concourse using Spring Cloud pipelines. We didn't look at a lot of things. We didn't look at single sign-on with OAuth and Spring Cloud security, right? We have a lot of things that we could have looked at, but I'm afraid that'll have to do uh, for another session, another time. Uh, je vous remercie d'être venu. Merci beaucoup pour uh, votre attention. Uh, si vous avez des questions, n'hésitez pas, n'hésitez pas à me les poser en, en français ou bien en anglais. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much. Cheers. Applaudissements.